Sure, yeah, well that's uh, east, of, uh, east of Richmond, down near Bird Airport. California. Yeah, I think uh, Richmond was where a great many of them lived, or even that vicinity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Richmond's a good. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. And we got Steve? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Phyllis, uh, tell me about uh, uh, this period in uh, 1947 during the summer when you came to see your father. Uh, at what, what, what did your father do in Roswell? My father was the sheriff of Texas Crown, and uh, um, they lived in the, the uh, courthouse. The jail and the sheriff's quarters were in the same building, and they lived on the downstairs floor, and then on downstairs was an office <coughs> with two rooms, and uh, the uh, jail was upstairs, and we went from St. Andrew's office, and then up to the, the uh, jail. And what, were, were you living with the folks in 1947? No, I wasn't living with them. I was there visiting. Uh -huh. uh, I, uh, my husband and I were both students after World War II in Las Vegas, New Mexico, uh -huh. in uh, Highlands, New York, and finish up our degrees with the Florida Institute of War. Mm -hmm. and inter our education had been interrupted by World War II. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so we went back, but I sometimes did not go quite as much because I had a young son and uh, uh, he liked to stay with my mother. <laughs> and if I was busy going to school, and we also owned a little business and we worked in it. And so uh, he stayed there and probably he'd been there for a while or I don't know whether at that point in time I was actually in school or just going back and forth and, and then staying up there a while and staying in school for a while. So you came to visit your father at his office one day in July, we think? <laughs> yes, I came to, I, uh, I, uh, was reading the, uh, you could just walk into his office from the sheriff's quarters. And uh, I, the paper came out with this, and I did read the paper. What do you remember about what the paper said? Uh, about the headlines and the, the flying saucer sound. And uh, I don't remember whether he told me about it before then or not. I don't know. <laughs> but I did, was so interested, and I, in some way inside of me, and I loved it. I wanted it to be true, and uh, I went, wanted to talk to him about it. And sometimes I talked to him in the kitchen or something, but I went into the office and talked to him about it. And he was getting all these phone He had, I remember he came into the kitchen and told about that he'd been up all night to get the phone calls, and that he had just talked to London, England, and he was very excited about that. dryers, they, nothing, because they spent all their time on the uh, military and uh, weapons and those things. So there were no, so we had to wait a while to get a car, we had to wait a while to get a flight machine because they just didn't want to market. So you've read about this flying saucer incident in the, in the, in the newspaper and you went and talked to your father him, about it. Asked him about it. And, uh, what did he tell you? And, um, I asked him, um, do you think this is true? And uh, he said, I don't know why the asshole would have come all the way in here and brought that stuff if it hadn't been something important and that he didn't, that he, it had to be something that he thought. And he had sent 
have a deep path to do that. And um, he was deep thought. I see. So originally he thought it was true, but he didn't have any information. He was trying to see the deputy to get some more information. <coughs> and I guess it was like the first thing he did was call the deputy. were turned away by the uh, Army Air Force. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, I think it was in the next day that the Army Air Force all came to the office and uh, my teacher came to me. And what happened when you got to your father's uh, office? Was it? Uh, we uh, we come in and uh, we had a small child and Roger was the stopping place for us to come to my place and we needed to get to Roger for one, uh, once a week. Right. And when we arrived, why, uh, I noticed that there were jeeps and some people, you know, from the Air Force there. And, uh, of course, I went right in with my small child, and my husband, Jay, went into the office, and he said to my father, what's going on, George? And he said, well, we've had a man come in uh, saying that there's a fine saucer and bringing a piece of things, and said, uh, I don't know what it is, and said we are investigating. He said, uh, what was it? And he said, well, uh, it looked like a burnt grass, just like burnt grass out there. And my husband came back into the office, I mean, back into the kitchen. Uh, my mother prepared the meal with the prisoners, and we were in the kitchen. And uh, we didn't discuss it anymore or anything. And uh, as the years went along, mother would say, oh, remember the time when we had the flying in Roswell, and uh, papers were out, and uh, where I live, I'm very isolated. I don't, uh, I go 20 miles for my mail one way and 20 miles back, so I'm not accustomed to getting a newspaper very often, and I had no telephone, I had no electricity at that time, because we still were in the rural area, so I, it was another week, see, then, before I probably went back to town and knew anything too particular about it, because I did stay all night. I went in and turned down and came back because we had milk cows that we had to get home to uh, at night. So I really was not uh, as familiar with it as Phyllis because she was staying all night there because she was had, had, was going to school up at Robert Bay. And, uh, but as the years went along, Mother would always say, and I also know of an article that she wrote that said, uh, 
we do not, as to this day, know if there, whether it's a flying saucer or what, because they told us, my husband, Mr. Wilcox, excuse me, said, don't you say a word. So he didn't, and he was very calm about it. I mean, he just didn't say anything. Who told him not to say the word? Uh, the Air Force did. When they came and picked up the piece or whatever they did, he said they uh, reprimanded him. That's what the words were in the little article she wrote. And uh, I had it because she wrote a, a great deal, and she wrote an article on their four years at the county jail. They were not in the county jail, but that's what she said, four years in the county jail. But they were there as uh, working on the very back page of her uh, article, she wrote uh, the day the flying saucer was in Marshall, New Mexico. Remember what that date, what she said that date was? Now, the date was not on the uh, paper. That's the reason I don't. And uh, uh, she said in 19, uh, on the outside of this uh, article, said, I uh, sent this article to the Reader's Digest in 19 See, she had typed it over. It she had a whole bunch of typed in uh, things, and uh, but they did not accept it. That was written on the outside. She also said that she, uh, I don't know whether she took the article or she spoke to the Historical Society in Marshall. It said, uh, his Roswell Historical Society in Marshall, New Mexico, on in 1980. So she might have taken the article over to the did your father describe to either of you what this material that Max Frizzell brought in looked like? Did not to me. He either. said um, he brought some material with him and it some junk. Like, I don't know what it is. Except the best I can do about what it was. Right. It's about the mm -hmm. And uh, about the Air Force warning, there also This is a real and true story. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, <coughs> she had spoken about it some after, you know, that. But, and I think, uh, and uh, she had talked to different members of the family that, that there was a, a, a crash and there were bodies in it, but that they could not say anything about it. She mm -hmm. told my daughter. She I had told people. And I think maybe I had one. talked about bodies? Yes. That, had, that she had heard that there were bodies recovered? Yeah. Um, what about Max Frizzell? What happened to him during this period of time? Well, the Air Force took him right away, and, and uh, he really never came back to the Air Soccer. And the material was left there, and the Air Force picked it up and father said, I said, well, what are you calling the people on the talk? He said, I don't have any information. I have to tell them. I don't know that it is a society. I don't really know. I, ha I haven't seen it. I can't go in there. And, and the, the Air Force is handling it, and I'm referring Paul to the Air Force. Well, that's right. He said, since I they didn't even ask her, I don't think I'll see it, according to some of the witnesses here. He said that he had had calls from all over. She wrote it in this article, the name, the place where they had the calls from that morning when we got to town. And uh, it was quite exciting. It was rushing around there a little bit, but uh, we just, uh, uh, just didn't go in. I just didn't go in the office. I just uh, stayed back in the kitchen with Mother, and then she told us what my father said, but she said that he was not to say one word, and she didn't say anything either for years and years. Yes, I'm not saying anything. Yeah, anything. years. Now, I think it was four years in the county jail, so she had to write this article after uh, 1951. So.
it's a private facility. So we don't have any, um, I, we don't have any base. Mm -hmm. We don't have any crew. I'm mm -hmm. guessing that there's electricity to myself. Okay. That's just what we had talked about guessing it to be. Electricity is like 40. No, well, like 50. See, see, this happened in 47. Okay. And then they were still in the sheriff's office until, I believe it was 49. It may have been. Uh, okay, so we're just adding some years onto that and right. saying that that's the title of the article is four years in the county jail. Right. So they had to be out of there. It's the only question really is when did your mother write the article well, not I when think, this incident happened. Well, I know yeah. that. And yeah, we're right. trying to say right. we think that it was in the, in the 50s. 50s. Mm -hmm. We think it was in My the 50s. My father became very ill right after he came out of the sheriff's office. Uh -huh. And she was traveling around trying to find the best doctors and everything in the world to help him and they, she was very, very busy and she was, had not started a business or had anything, you know, because she had just come out of the job and he didn't have a job. So then she became a real estate agent and all and she did the work and my father then passed on and uh, he died in uh, 64 or something like that or 60, I can't remember what year. Oh, he had 58. No, it was in 60, we decided, we I think the other day was 60. about uh, Max Brazell's uh, being detained by the Army Air Force? I didn't hear. Philip, did you? Well, I don't know when I heard it. I, I know he was detained by the Army Air Force. Uh -huh. And I know he was out there. But after all, you know, we had just been through all this business here, plus we had been interviewed before, plus I had read the Russell incident, the MJ-12, listened to Sam Friedman talk. So stuff. I have, yeah, in the last two years. See, have, I, but I heard so you say not your perception. You're sure what you knew, when you knew it. Uh, this is uh, true. I don't know what I knew about travel until after I read the book and after. Uh, but when I, I when I talked to my father, he said, I do. don't know why Brazel would have brought that stuff in. And uh, some way he indicated trusted uh, Brad and uh, it's probably because he was in Mexico ranch came all the way trying to tell somebody mm -hmm. you know I found something unusual mm -hmm. and someone helped me and so I think I did get that impression mm -hmm. then I know I did but when what I else I know about Brazel's concern would your father have known a weather balloon if uh, if that's what, what it was? Do you recognize it? Oh, I think so. Oh, I yes, we had all of them on our ranch. Uh, they're little square boxes, and uh, you can uh, the balloon just just deflates, it's just, and you pick them up. I, there's been a number of them. They have a place that you can send them back to yeah. Yeah. their fort. So your father said, that now. He, he, as far as he was concerned, from what you know, that this was not a weather balloon. Oh no, I don't. Think brought a piece of, of a saucer, you know, a piece of metal or whatever it was. They had the metal no in that office, in the small office over there, with the door shut. Nobody went in there. Uh -huh. It was locked. And the Air Force picked it up. Uh -huh. and From took your it. father's office? Yes. yes. And took it and said, don't you say another word about this. They had a little meeting in there when they picked it up. And that's they had all the chiefs. And it's like they said, that's probably Military, yeah. uh, jeep, you know how a jeep drives up in front. If you uh, have something, there were open jeeps when it was hot weather, and they just were two as they got out and, and in the office, and that's all. The I know. thing and besides I that, I did not go in there unless it wasn't busy. You know, I didn't go <laughs> and stand and listen to anything that sure. was not my business. Sure. You know? My husband went in there and just did all the time because he was a man. Yeah, women wouldn't go in. There. And, and mine did too, I'm sure. But I just. Uh, you know, I went only when he was by himself or when I really didn't need to go someplace. Did your father ever name any of the military people who were involved with taking this material out of his office? No, not to me either. What happened after the Air Force said this was a weather balloon? Uh, as far
far as the calls. Well, then they just uh, went down because they uh, the Air Force said that they were the balloon and they just keep trying to go with the balloon. Right. <laughs> Lots of people retired. They're not natives like uh, we are. 
So now we have to take those into consideration if you're talking about the majority of them that live there right now. But the people who live here then, okay, let's say that. You think most of them? No, I think, I think that it would be the same. I, I have, uh, when I got here, I arrived and I, there was a friend of mine who um, had a daughter who just moved up here, so I gave her a call. And I said, uh, Alice, I'm here. She said, oh, what are you doing up here? And I said, well, I came to, uh, it's kind of a convention for uh, UFOs or flying saucers, just in that conversation that was something at Roswell. And she said, oh, yes, I remember about that one. And I, I haven't seen, uh, she is, uh, she's been in Saudi Arabia, she's been in Sweden, she's been all over, and she was oil, in the oil business, and they had moved up here. And I said, well, I'll give her a call. So the minute I said it to her, she had heard of it because her mother, father, probably told her. She said she probably is in her 40s. So she, she would be someone that her mother would have to tell that, uh, about the flying saucer or the wobble. And she, they lived about 20 miles from me, but uh, that's neighbors. That's as close as mine get. <laughs> well, I know you ladies have both lines yeah, to yeah, take, so you. I'm not going to uh, keep you any Thank you. No, we appreciate it. I just like to ask. Then you come in with your questions. You bet. Okay. Well, I'll just get you started. Just ask me what you were doing in 1947. How's that? Okay. Tell me what you were doing. That's it. Good. Do you have any introduction? Nope. No introduction at all. We're just rolling the tape, and I'd just like to ask you what you were doing in 1947. Then go on. 1947, I was. Uh, at the air base in Roswell, I was in the military, and I was first lieutenant at the time. My assignments were three, <laughs> interestingly enough. Mm -hmm. uh, I was assistant flying safety officer, I was assistant base operations officer, and I was assistant group operations officer. Now, the group was the 509th Bomb Group. And because of uh, the building I worked in, all three offices that I just told you about were contained in the same building. And uh, for a time, it seems I was running back and forth. At that time, I was primarily in group operations. And the call came in one day to the range to have B-29 ready to go as soon as possible. someone asked uh, where to, I said, just get a crew on board and uh, have the airplane stand by and we're going to go to Fort Worth. And it was, that was Colonel Blanchard's directive. So I was out in the operations office. I uh, have to explain to you, the building is an H-shaped building. And the, uh, the vertical part of the H is where the two hallways were one on each side, but the one on the right side uh, ran directly from the parking area out front and went straight through the building and out to the ramp of the aircraft. The cross of the H, half of it was the operations, base operations office, where the uh, base pilots came in, filled out their flight plan, and stepped to one side and obtained their weather briefing read notices to airmen, got all the material ready to go. And the flight clearance then was taken and submitted to the tower to let them know that something was going to happen and the, the air traffic control and so forth. As I explained last night, uh, trying to, or yesterday afternoon, late, trying to clarify a point, uh, each squadron also had their own operations set up they could release their aircraft without going through base operations. Let us know that the group was taking off and uh, just how many airplanes it was. But 
they had already handled all their arrangements with air traffic control and with the tower and so forth. At any rate, I was in that operations office and Colonel Blanchard drove up and came in and asked, is the aircraft ready? And I and one other fellow there, who is now dead, uh, said, yes, it's sitting right out front, ready to go. And with this, he turned, stepped out at, back into the hallway and w waved to some people outdoors and still sitting in the automobile. And uh, I suspect, trying to recall now, there were four or five or six people. And I'll say, I'll say five. Doesn't really matter. But uh, they came in the front door, straight down the hallway, and right out onto the ramp to climb into the airplane. And these were the people that were carrying parts of the crashed flying saucer at that time, a UFO today, that uh, I got to see. And that was the only thing I got to see. And it was very short, very quick. The, uh, Colonel Blanchard, in order to get out of their way, had backed into the doorway of the uh, ops office. And I stepped up to him and said, Colonel, turn sideways. I want to see, too. <laughs> Maybe if I hadn't said that to him, made it obvious that I was there, uh, I would not have been shipped out two weeks later. <laughs> uh, what was his immediate response to your request? Well, he just turned and, if you knew Colonel Blanchard, and he, when he went on to become three-star general and vice chief of staff, uh, he was a very commanding presence. And uh, he, was a, he was a good officer, a, a real leader. When he said he wanted something, people said, yes, sir, and, and it wasn't just because that he was a military. Uh, so he just turned and looked at me, and he did turn sideways so that I could half step into the doorway and watch the fellows go through. And what I, thus I saw them carrying certain pieces of these metal uh, items. And uh, as I've described to other people when asked, the, uh, they had one piece that was, oh, I like to say uh, 18 to 24 inch or uh, coffee table top size, brushed stainless steel in color. Maybe if you think of uh, a common aluminum foil roll today, when you pull it out, uh, one side's real reflective, but that's not what it was. Like the opposite side, which is rather dull, doesn't have great reflective power. And I've heard it mentioned now, of course, so many times about the uh, I beam with the markings on it and so forth. And I actually saw that piece of I beam being carried through and, and saw the markings. But it was a case of here it was. And there it went. And, uh, Very quick. That was all I got to see. They went out, got on board the aircraft, went to Fort Worth. And uh, Major Marcel went with us. So. I mentioned the operational setup. This is, has become clear in discussion that uh, there's some confusion about what airplane went where? One of the first interviews I did, I, uh, they asked me about a B-29. I said, oh, there was a, there was a B-25 also. Well, a couple days later, we had occasion to set up a B-25, takes do something and take something to Fort Worth. Then there was a third flight, and this was the B-29 that Happy Henderson was the pilot, and he flew to Wright-Patterson Field in Dayton, Ohio. Directly from Roswell? Yes. No stop off? No. I say that, not really knowing that answer, but going back to the time element involved, 
Every, I, I sensed the other day that everyone got the impression that uh, Major Marcel went out to the crash site, picked up this material, brought it on base, showed it to the colonel, and it was flown out. And at the same time, Walter Hawk had made this paper, this newspaper release, public relations release, and within 12 hours, it was all squashed, killed. And every, I, I picked up that everyone was thinking that everything went out on that flight. They went to Fort Worth, and then they went on to the right path. have to jump now 40 years <laughs> Feel free. because uh, something that happened in our house was, was a couple we had in for dinner and I knew he was a mortician and retired on the 40th anniversary the local paper in Roswell reprinted the story of the flying saucer and the pictures or the sketches and they had a couple sketches of what the aliens were supposed to look like. These alien bodies that were claimed to have been found. As we were walking to the front door down our hallway, this fellow turned to me and said, did you see yesterday's paper? And, I, uh, and the article on the, the Roswell incident, I said, yes, I did. And shock number one comes when he said, that's what they look like. Thus we stop and talk a little bit, and I come to find out, and he has since been interviewed by Stanton Friedman. He was a mortician on duty that received a phone call from the air base asking for child-sized caskets and body bags that night. Or say it the night after the first airplane flew out. <clears throat> it developed that this individual uh, was driving an ambulance for the mortuary, which was a service they provided the Air Force, and he had gone to pick up a, a sick airman in town and took him to the base hospital. Now, this is the next night, 24 hours later. And he said, I'll go over and see my girlfriend. And it happens that the nurse who handled the bodies was his, was his girlfriend. They had even been thinking about getting married. I don't recall her last name. Her first name was Naomi. He walked into her lab area immediately stopped by air police <laughs> and uh, escorted out. Before he was actually taken out, uh, she looked up and said, I will call you later. And he said, so where are you going? I said, I'm going to see my girlfriend, Lieutenant Thorne. Out. They took him out. Later they did meet, as he told me, she sketched on a prescription pad what the aliens looked like. And he had that uh, sketch and, and took it back to the mortuary and put it in a file in the drawer of his desk. We had a series of files on the work that he handled. There was all the record they were keeping. He delivered so many caskets, or he picked up so many airmen and took them to the hospital and so forth. Stanton Friedman interviewed this individual, and they arranged to go to the uh, file building that the mortuary still maintains. And they found all of the files, the manila folders and so forth, that he had had in his desk during the years he worked there, except that one file with the sketches in it and any remarks that he made. That had been picked up sometime and taken. By whom, they don't know.
here again, the secrecy veil has come down. <laughs> you said you were shipped out shortly after this happened. Yes. Now, as I explained yesterday to the people, to clarify this point of uh, the different flights. I sent, had learned, of course, that uh, the sergeant of the guard with a series of airmen went out and they surrounded the site and then they swept the area and picked up everything they could. And the bodies were brought in and uh, everything was laid out in Hangar 84. And what happened to them then? Well, as I was relating to the fellows, uh, the Air Force established a system of it was a base operations office for all normal activity and they controlled the weather station, they controlled the crash equipment, the tower operation that oversaw the control of the immediate area. Each squadron had its own contact and own operations and they could set up their own training flights, establish their own contact with air traffic control tell the tower that they were going to take off tomorrow at 10 a.m., the whole 12 airplanes or however many, and all they provided to the base was the, the fact that 12 airplanes leaving tomorrow and they'd be gone on a, let's say, a 15-hour mission. And that's all we needed to know, speaking in terms of representing the, the group ops and the base ops. And one of the squadrons, this is about three days later now, or four days, announced a, a training flight and their aircraft all took off, let's say this morning, in the order that was prescribed and so forth. And one of those aircraft was flown by Pappy Henderson, which had been loaded with all the material out of Hangar 84 and went to Wright Paddock. Including bodies? Yes. Casket that this friend of mine had supplied from the mortuary. Did you see the casket for the body? No, I didn't. How, how do you know that they were on that flight? Because that's when they got there. <laughs> uh, how do I know? I, I was told that that's what Pappy Henderson said he carried. He was in the hangar and, and saw this material and saw that his aircraft was loaded. years before he mentioned anything to anybody. Yeah. At any rate, in other words, what I was trying to convey is everything did not go out with that first airplane. And when the next flights went, we can't find out today. There's no way of tying it down. That's not important. The point is that once the secrecy veil dropped and Colonel Blanchard was informed and he informed his staff a day later, this, the official story is this was a weather balloon and that's it. And nothing further need be said. I ran into, uh, I, I don't call it a misunderstanding, a lack of understanding on the part of, of a couple of investigative reporters who asked me a leading question and I turned and looked at them and I said, I've been looking at you and I said, how old are you? And they were rather startled, you know, he said, and when were you born? Well, he, he was born around the time of the Korean War, 52, 51, 53, you know, different dates for different people. All right. I said, your knowledge of war has been limited to the Vietnam situation and the confusion that was going on and the lack of support by people uh, for, the, for that war and, and really the confused way it was run by Washington. Never before in the history of, of uh, military operations has a, 
the national capital set back and told the people how many bombs they can drop tomorrow or how many shells they can fire and they're doing just a, a ridiculous way to run an operation but back in oh the question had evolved because of Walter Hawk and myself who knew each other at the air base knew of who a year and a half later or two years later shared an office for a year in town as civilians. He was running his little thing and I was running my little operation. And we cut expenses by sharing an office. And he had raised the question with Walter and then with me, how come you fellas never talk to each other? And Walter had made the remark, well, I guess I know what I know and he knows what he knows and that was it. Well, how come you didn't talk to each other? That's what I'm leading to. And why I asked him how old he was. World War II, if you didn't experience it, it's very difficult to understand. But I said, someone came up and slapped the collective nose of the country. We fought back. And it was in the newspapers, it was in magazines, it was on the radio statements similar to uh, loose lips sink ships. You know, don't talk about anything. Don't let on you know anything because someone's going to take the information and use it to your detriment. Uh, I said college campuses got into it, but uh, not by using signs that said uh, minefield, don't walk here, rather than keep off the grass. Newly seeded area, and they had it roped off and a minefield. Don't step here. Consequently, the, the entire country became, in a sense, brainwashed. Everyone was concerned with World War II. And I asked the question: Did you realize ever? Did you ever know that everyone on the coastline had blackout curtains on their windows and on their doors? someone rang the doorbell, they turned out the lights before they opened the door? And he said, no. I said, well, this is true. All the way down the eastern coast around Florida and the Gulf of Mexico. The theory being we shouldn't allow the enemy to know where our cities were. Of course, now they could sit out there during the day and, and watch. And people in New Jersey could look out on the ocean and see tankers being blown up by torpedoes. This was taking place right out there. And the, this is the way we operated. You were told not to talk about anything. And then if you were in the military, it was even more emphasized. Consequently, Walter knew his, his thing, and I knew my thing, and we never talked about it. We had never talked to one another about the Roswell incident until after we were invited to come here. And suddenly we both. <laughs> what do you think? I guess we Correct. both felt we had to explain to each other what we did know. What do you think happened? What crashed in the next uh, 1947? I think some type of craft of which we were not at all familiar uh, had a problem and did come apart and crashed in the desert area of New Mexico. I really do. As the properties of the material that was found was unknown to all our scientists. The bodies had never been, and no one had ever been seen like that before if these sketches were true, and, and I feel they were. You knew this mortician pretty well, didn't you? Yes, it developed <laughs> that he and my wife went to school together, and his wife and I knew each other through some friends from the moment I first went to, uh, to Roswell in 1945 to learn to fly the 829 And uh, we were very close friends and came close to marrying one another, uh, you know, 
and she as much so told that to my wife. <laughs> uh, just that you got there first to my wife, Joanne. And uh, we've been close friends ever since, no, all this time. Ever since the event took place, we knew each other. And we never talked about it. What happened to the nurse? The nurse? I've heard conflicting stories. I'll jump back to the time of just after the, the incident occurred. The airplanes are taking the parts and, and the body of Stephen. Uh, I was shipped out to the Philippines. How soon after? Two weeks, you said? Within two weeks. Was that, was that unexpected? Well, it developed it was unexpected. Uh, these things occur off and on with people. But there was a telegram, a TWX called the military, came in from 8th Air Force that said, urgent need of one each Flying safety officer, MOS number such and such, report to Clark Field in the Philippines. And they turn around and, and look. Well, I, I'm not even sure but what it might have had my name on because I was the only weights and balance officer on that base. And uh, so I was shipped out going to Clark Field in the Philippines uh, because of being weights and balance on. I understand the nurse was shipped out the same week, the sergeant of the guard and the guards, all of them, who were surrounded the site, swept the area and picked the pieces up, they were all shipped out. And every one of us went to a different base someplace around the world so that no two of us were together. Oh yes, I believe it was by design because it takes, it, it's been looking back through the years and even at that time I s suspected something because I got to Clark Field and they didn't need a weights and balance officer. They had never asked for it. Well, I said, well, that's what this telegram says. And they said, we don't care what that says. We, we don't need one. We've got one. And uh, we don't need another one. And they said, uh, what else do you do? And I said, well, operations officer. They said, all right, we'll assign you the squadron so-and-so as the operations officer. And that's where I, where I went. And uh, we were involved in photo, high altitude photo recon. from high altitude. Where was the nurse shipped out? I understand she was shipped to Germany, and I understand I was told that there was an airplane crash and she and a group of her nurses were all killed. The sergeant of the guard that surrounded the territory and picked up the material, he lives in New Mexico, and I understand just recently spoke to one of the reporters for the first time, but his information has not been released in any of the stories. I say that because the investigative reporter said, Bob, you just saw him, and uh, he has spoken to us for the first time since the event. Now, that was, where was he? Well, that was nearly 43 years. We're the first ones he's talked to. He said, we're not going to use any of his material at this point because we have to dovetail and collaborate and make sure that. But he said, I am finding that what you said, talk, speaking to me, he said, what you have told us this evening just emphasizes and proves the point what everyone else just said. Particularly in the group 
reporter, by the way, who had come out of New York City, and he said when he got the assignment, he was totally aghast that they would think of sending him out to research some unidentified flying object, which he didn't believe. <laughs> but he says, I have become convinced of being here. <laughs> and uh, so roughly speaking, that's my story. It, uh, I saw a couple things. I was involved with scheduling aircraft. I was shipped out with several other people all about the same time. And uh, 40 years went by before uh, a best friend of mine uh, spoke up for the first time and said, I know something about that. Since that time, Stanford Friedman has interviewed the individual. I uh, took them took Stanton up in the mountains to meet the man because Stanton didn't know whether he should go. This was rather interesting. As an aside, perhaps had nothing to do with the interview. But uh, I was talking with Stanton in his hotel room in Roswell and Stanton said, well, so-and-so has invited me up there for dinner tomorrow. Do you suppose I ought to go? You know, it was kind of Try and drive up there if you think it'd be worthwhile. And I said, Stan, knowing this individual, he's one of the good old boys. He speaks his piece. If he invited you to come up and have dinner with him, that means he wants you to come up and have dinner with him. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't a polite thing he was doing. So it's an exceptional thing he's doing. So I went home and cleared the decks with my wife and called Stan back and said, I'll take you up there tomorrow to help you and I'll introduce you to the individual. So we did. They had a great interview and then we all went in to have dinner together and we continued the interview, clarifying some points for uh, Stanton. But you and, and the more Fisher friend both had a, an interesting relationship with Naomi and Lily. I, kind of, I have to ask what you think about what you were told about her having been killed in, in a plane accident. I mean, well, did my, you accept my, that? Uh, my only thought was uh, I had two thoughts about it. One is, gosh, what a waste because uh, when I was working in uh, there was in group operation, the, uh, the colonel who sat in front of me, or I should say the colonel operations officer, <laughs> behind whom I sat was my desk, and uh, to my left was Major Woody Swanfit, who uh, flew the bikini drop, Colonel got an assignment to go overseas. And his airplane was reportedly blown up over the ocean. And he had nothing to do with uh, the Roswell incident because he was going overseas before the Roswell incident took place. And it was one of those things. That the fellows are here today, and gosh, Fred, you're going where tomorrow? Oh, is that right? You know. Your airplane goes down, you're lost. Hmm? Well, there's another friend gone. And that's the way you thought about it. The second thing I, I thought of in regards to Naomi and the nurses was, of course, now I'm overseas. I learned this either while I was there or at, right after I got back that uh, her airplane had been lost. So the possibilities. One was the normal natural thing of, of some kind of an airplane being lost because it does occur. Or, boy, is the government taking that extreme to control what she knows? <laughs> because she was the one who actually worked on the body. And uh, another thing was that they had called this mortician. him for uh, information on 
taking care of the body because Keith had just newly returned from the, the school with the latest methods known at that time uh, on how to preserve the body. So he had related to her what he knew. And she was trying to do that. And, uh, she had more first-hand information about the alien body than anyone else. What about yourself? Do you have any concern uh, with what we know about right now? Are you drawing attention? No. no. So there's, there's not any direct pull that the government has over you in terms of that did you sign any kind of secrecy oath? No. Uh, I was not told to keep quiet. Uh, some people were, mm -hmm. whom they felt had more information than than they knew I did. Right. Right. <laughs> and uh, it's just, it's, as I learned, everyone was shipped out. Right. So that probably pretty much took care of it. I that suppose. was the first initial thing. Uh, this mortician, <coughs> for example, because of his involvement, he was visited. His mother and father were visited by military people whether they were in uniform or, or in civilian dress. Mm -hmm. And they were warned not to say anything to anybody about anything. Mm -hmm. Very direct. Mm -hmm. And once again, it, it, I believe this ran without fail. Mm -hmm. And uh, so some people were directly told. Uh, others were just shipped out. I came back from overseas and learned that Walter Pott had, had resigned his commission. And thus, they left him alone. Walter, of course, uh, as you probably know, never did see any, he personally never saw any of the parts or pieces or whatever. He just happens to be the guy that wrote the release that stirred everything up. <laughs> yeah, and again, it was on. I still get tongue-tied and forget things. Uh, questions that I've answered 15, 20 times. Same question, but flip it a little bit differently. Uh -huh. You have to shake your head and back off and uh, regroup. Yeah. Well, but I, I'll be giving you my standard lecture about I want you to be relaxed, just do me talking, just sort of ignore um, the camera, uh, just pretend they're not here. <coughs> I do have this bad habit, and you may think I'm looking over the camera. I'll do that occasionally. I'll just, you know, when I'm trying to think, I may uh, lose eye contact with you, and that was just strictly, uh, I want a break. I may just, uh, that's a good excuse, and I look away so that I can stop for a tenth of a second. Okay. Are we rolling? Yes, we are. All right. Uh, Mr. Hall, can you? Tell me about the day that Colonel Blanchard gave you a call and told you to put out a news release. What, uh, what was happening that day, as you, as you recall, in your phone conversations with him? Basically, up until the time I got the phone call from him, I sure can't tell you what was happening. It was probably a very routine day. Uh, I was doing either some public relations work, base housing, uh, or something else. I really, uh, I can't remember what it was. It was just the normal work day. Got the telephone call from Colonel Blanchard, and in essence, he told me that uh, we had in, he had in his possession a flying saucer or parts thereof. Gave me a little bit of idea where it came from, and <coughs> the ranch north, west of Roswell. Then stated that uh, Major Marcel, Jesse Marcel, who was our base intelligence officer, was going to fly it to Fort Worth, turn it over to General Roger Ramey, who was commander, commanding general of the Eighth Air Force at that time, Fort Worth. And what did 
Colonel Blanchard wants you to do. He told me to prepare a release uh, with basically the information that he gave me over the phone when it was done to take it into the community and deliver it, hand deliver it to the four uh, news media we had in Roswell at that time, which is what I did. Uh, as best you recall, would that uh, have happened uh, initial phone conversation during the morning or in the afternoon? To the best of my remembrance, it would have been in the morning. And I would have to guess somewhere I would guess around 9 o'clock. The only reason why I come up with that figure is that had to be done and gotten into town so that it would have gone to the uh, record in time for them to set it and to have gone ahead and run it in that uh, state evening paper. And would you know what day this happened? I would say the 8th of July, 1947. And that was the date of the Roswell Daily Record yes. article. What, uh, once you wrote up the news release, then what happened after that? As I said, I, I had to take it into town. Uh, he told me to take it in so that if there was any validity to the fact that this was a flying saucer, that and information got out to other news media other than our own, he felt that he wanted our people there in Roswell who had first crack at it. Didn't want them to feel that he had given the information out to someone who got it to the uh, press services uh, outside of Roswell. So I took it into town and delivered it to the four news media in town, two radio stations and two newspapers. Do you happen to recall what your itinerary was? Who you went to first, for example? I'm almost certain I went to radio station KGFL first. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, to uh, KSWS, they were a half a block north. And then I took it to the uh, Daily Record, which was a block further north. And then on my way back out to the base, I dropped it off at the morning dispatch blocks from the Daily Record. What, uh, what's your recollection about the reception initially when you handed out this news release to these various local outlets? Uh, did anybody read this material and respond immediately? I don't believe they did. Uh, I believe, again, we're going back some many, many years, I believe uh, the first place I went was to, as I said, to KGFL, and I believe I just simply uh, left it on the desk of the receptionist. Best I recall, she was not there. And I, Frank Joyce, to the best of my memory, was in the studio, and he could see the reception area and also see out on the street. And I think I probably pointed at it uh, indicate that it was something for them. Uh, I don't remember what had happened at uh, KSWS. The record, I gave it to the editor because he sat close to the front door. Uh, probably said, hi, Don, how are you, Dad? Might like to have this or, you know, very, uh, nothing fantastic, just uh, the normal routine, what I did when I brought him a uh, news release. And then I went down to the uh, dispatch. Again, I believe there I took it into uh, either the editor's office or the publisher's office. I knew both of them real well. And occasionally I'd stick my head in and shoot the breeze with the publisher. Uh, the actual delivering of it to who I gave it, it uh, I may have seen a half a dozen people in the different uh, news media offices and who I finally said, here it is. And, uh, it's kind of hard to differentiate from one to the other. Nothing real remarkable. Nothing. Like that. Nobody said, oh, wow. Uh, you know, <laughs> just 
But they're most of put down. The way most they, journalists treat news releases. Yeah. That's right. And uh, this was not uh, something that was unusual because you walk into someone's office and say, here's a news release, which I had done many, many times. And nothing was uh, that hot that they had it grab it and run back and stop presses and that type of thing. So it was just a matter of just a, they took it and probably glanced at it and we had a few words and I went my merry way. And what happened next after you had completed your appointed rounds? I returned to the base and when I got into my office, the phone was ringing, I picked it up and the first call was from uh, London, England. The question was, how did Major Marcel know how to fly this object? I had, in the release, had stated that Major Marcel had flown the object to Fort Worth, meaning that he had put it on an airplane and got in and flew the airplane. It was a poor choice of words the way I put it. Uh, there were a tremendous number of calls to the same this was an unidentified flying object, how would we have someone within our Air Force that knew how to just get in there and flip switches and run controls? Some of them, uh, oh, some of them were rather terse. And this is another one of those fly-by-night stories. Uh, can you verify it? Now, one commanding officer, the one that stated it, Well, verification enough for you. For me, that was more than enough verification. When he said something, that was the law. Yeah. That went on continually. We had continual phone calls. I had uh, people that were working for me in the office uh, left somewhere around 5 o'clock in the morning, stay till 6 o'clock or so. I left there probably until 7 30, 8 o'clock. By that time, it tapered off. over what had happened during the course of the day and beyond uh, the Rodwell incident. The, the base didn't stop operating because of, we found that so-called flying saucer. What happened the next day, as you recall? The only thing that happened of any import, as far as I was concerned, I believe I read it in the morning newspaper or heard it on the news that General Ramey said that we didn't have a flying saucer, that that was a weather balloon. With which I just breathed a tremendous sigh of relief and I think I turned to one of the people in the office and said, well, we sure made fools of us again. Uh, then again, we fit in the category of hundreds of others that had said they saw flying objects. It was not uncommon. Uh, the people will think they had a flying object and then lo and behold, uh, it shot down. Beyond that, that was the end of it. Did you see <coughs> any of this wreckage or any, any of the material? None whatsoever. Do you believe that Colonel Blanchard had seen it? Yes, I do. And why do you feel that way? Uh, I don't think he would have been so say gung-ho, but I don't think he would have been so confident in his comment of, we have a flying saucer in our possession, or parts of a flying saucer. I don't really, over this many years, I don't remember the exact wording, but uh, he wasn't overly excited. He wasn't flipping about it. It was just a normal, routine type of conversation that uh, we'd have when he'd call me and say, we want this done. But he sounded pretty positive about it. He sounded positive, yes. About what he had. Would you have any reason to believe that Colonel Blanchard would have mistaken this material for being any form of weather balloon or observation device? I don't think there's a one chance in a billion that he would not have recognized. Not 
too many years. Uh, very intelligent individual, uh, not the type to just jump off on tangents. I think he knew a weather balloon if he had seen it, and that would have been the end of that. And he wouldn't have gone anywhere with it. He would have told uh, Major Marcel, uh, this is a weather balloon. Then again, Major Marcel would have known that it wasn't a weather balloon. That was my next question. Is it possible that Major Marcel would have been misled? Or no. Is it possible that Major uh, Colonel Blanchard might have been misinformed by somebody who told them about, told him about what this wreckage was without having seen it for himself? I would doubt that very much. I don't think uh, he would have uh, taken the actions he did by taking, going down to operations with it. Uh, if he was there in the operations building, he certainly saw it. I'm sure that Major Marcel had talked to him and had given him some pretty safe advice as far as he was concerned. Um, never heard the rumor. Um, I don't know how much Jess Marcel knew about it, but he, again, was a very intelligent individual and not the type that would just jump at uh, anything and try to carry it to, to an end. Between the two of them, I'm certain that one or the other would have called the other one's hand if it uh, was a weather balloon. So what did you think when uh, General Ramey said it was a weather balloon? Did you believe that? Uh, well, in 1947, when the general said it was a weather balloon, it was a weather balloon. And it was a load off of our mind, uh, as far as I was concerned, when I said our mind, my office. Focus we were attention. out of it completely. You're just as happy that that was the case. Very much so. Uh, that was, as far as I was concerned, that was the end of the story. Uh, surprisingly, I used to see General, at that time, he became Captain Colonel General uh, Blanchard. When he'd come into town, he'd call me and I'd go out and have breakfast with him or lunch. Uh, never a word was mentioned. that deliberate on your part? No. I had very frankly completely forgotten about it. And whether he had forgotten, I would doubt it very much, uh, but he just never brought it up. Uh, did anything happen? Uh, did the Colonel say anything about this incident shortly after General Ramey's statement? Perhaps in a staff meeting? In the next staff meeting, which was about a week later, I think we held him at that time, every Monday. Uh, he made some comments about our agenda and what we want to talk about. And I believe after those comments, he made some statement that was to the effect, we sure messed up on that one uh, last week. As a matter of fact, he took that outfit that was letting, sending those uh, weather balloons here on our station, they were from White Sands, and they were checking the upper atmosphere winds from east to west. And he, he sort of helped he, buttress the weather balloon right. theory. He, with that comment, we all, okay, we knew it all along. You know, we were all real smart all of a sudden knew that it wasn't a flying saucer. Did you ever have a chance to talk with uh, Jesse Marcel? Not time? until about well, 1980, the next time I talked to him. Uh, Jesse was, came to Roswell with Johnny Mann from a uh, TV station in uh, New Orleans. Uh -huh. He was taking uh, Mann out to the site to show him where it
kind of convinced me that uh, he was a neighbor of mine, a block down the street uh, in Roswell. Uh, I had nice regard for the man. He was a very fine individual. We were in quest of his son, who's now Dr. Marcel. Um, he was quite a sharp little 11 year old, I believe he was 11 or 12, whatever he was. He was as sharp as a cracker, and I think he still is. What about uh, another uh, officer there on the base that, who worked with uh, uh, Major uh, Marcel, uh, Sheridan Cabot? Does that name ring a bell with you? The name, yes, uh, I'd heard it. Uh, he was OSI or CIA or something. I had no association with him whatsoever at any time. Had you asked this question in 1947 and he walked by, I, said, I could have said that's him over there. Uh, that had been about the extent of it. Uh, had nothing to do with him in any way, manner, shape, or form. There uh, been some talk about the circumstances under which you left the, uh, the Air Force. The suggestion was that somehow you were pressured into, into leaving because of your involvement you want a long story or a very short story? Well, let's try the short version and then I can ask questions. Uh, at the time of the incident, we had a two-month-old daughter. We had built a house a couple months before. Uh, I was gone a lot of the time. I had about four different jobs. Uh, we were starting to wonder, well, I think my daughter at her age of two and a half or three months wondered what this was that came in the house every once in a while. My wife and I talked about it and talked about it and quite a decision for us to have made and try to decide stay in the service or get out. Well, we kicked this thing back and forth and back and forth and finally in February 1948 we decided that we stay in Roswell. I saw I knew enough people in business there that I could, if nothing else, I could get a job in Roswell. So I submitted my uh, letter of resignation. I was a regular Air Force officer. Uh, put down on Colonel Blanchard's desk April the 1st of 1948. On August the 18th of 1948, I got a Twix with, at the base. Started out with uh, First Lieutenant Walter G. Hawk, serial number 041123, and it goes on and on and on and on and on, and it states that uh, relieved of all duties and assignments and all that, and it ends up Mr. Walter G. Hawk's permanent address is 1405 West 7th Street, Roswell, New Mexico. I, I thought it was rather humorous. I start out as Lieutenant Hawk up here, uh -huh. and it twits that long uh -huh. at the bottom. I was no longer, I was Mr. Hot. Right. But uh, it had nothing to do whatsoever with uh, the incident or anything else that had happened on the base. It was just a personal matter that my wife and I both felt uh, we'd like to raise our daughter in Roswell. It's a small enough community, good school system, everything else. Uh, maybe we shouldn't have been thinking that far ahead at that point in our life. But it was one of the things that we were taking into account. I was also probably going to be transferred to Fort Worth within a matter of you know, four to six months. Uh, we didn't want to go to Fort Worth. We wanted to stay in a smaller community. Blanchard had told me that if I did go to Fort Worth that Relations Officer, 8th Air Force. He transferred over there subsequently and became uh, Operations Officer of 8th Air Force. And from then on, we started going up the ladder rather rapidly. He was rather well connected, wasn't he? Yes. His mentors, uh, General Curtis. I have to stop on that. I always want to say Curtis Easy LeMay. So 
So as far as you're concerned, you could have stayed with the military and enjoyed a rather bright future. No talk about your being shipped out after the... None whatsoever. Things just went on the way they had been going on until, well, from not the day I arrived on the station, but uh, after we came back from uh, Bikini, where I performed some public relations also for the 509 Air Attack Unit. And when I came back to Roswell, my two majors were the uh, group public relations also and also base public relations also. Do you have any regrets having been involved in this uh, incident? None whatsoever. I found them fascinating. Uh, I meet so many different people. 99% uh, are real nice, but once in a while that 1% always pops up and kind of squares you away and go on your merry way. It's been fun. In your heart of hearts, what do you think it was that uh, was in was on that ranch? Some type of craft from outer space, from where I do not know. Uh, I've talked to enough people uh, involved in it, of, uh, such as Jesse, Marcel Sr., and Junior, uh, other people that have had little uh, touch with Bob Shirky. something new, I'm kind of, wow, that really is a surprise. That puts another uh, crown, or star in the crown, or whatever you want to say about it. Uh, my feeling is that there's been so much that has been brought forward by legitimate people that there had to be something to it, and apparently that what it was, it was something that crash landed out there. Get you to express your desire about what our government should do about this at this point in history? Well, I, very frankly, I think that the government ought to take all files that they have uh, on this subject and turn them over to a committee of legitimate ufologists, if you would permit the use of that word, who are not negative, but will look at all the information uh, with an open mind and come up with a conclusion. I think that, uh, you know, this is censorship, pure and simple. And I, I don't like it. Uh, you want the right for people to walk the streets with placards and Protest. I wonder what would happen if a bunch of people started walking around the Pentagon or the archive carrying signs, we want the files. I don't think we'd get very far. <laughs> Is there anything that, uh, that I've missed in, in, in all of this that you feel is important to, to add to this record that we're trying to, trying to put together? Are there any experiences that you've had or any thoughts or concerns? Or well, all my experiences with this have been extremely pleasant. I've met some of the nicest people. I've only had one experience. Uh, it was a telephone call from a fellow called and when I came I was out at the time when I came home, my wife said, the shadow called you. And I was thinking, what? You know, the shadow, the squeaking door. Fellow called me. He was a friend from my 